Hello, everyone. Welcome to our event, The Election Reform Agenda, a deep dive into HR1, where we will discuss the most pressing issues on election administration that are shaping our democracy. My name is Carla Eckhart, and I'm the Executive Director of the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, where we support scholars in producing quality research that informs policy, social innovation, and nonprofit and philanthropic practices. Over the course of this series, we will be joined by a rich mix of experts on the topics in discussion, led by Nate Persley, the co-director of the Program on Democracy and the Internet at Stanford PAX and the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. I will turn it over now to our partners for this event, the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law, and the Associate Director and very capable leader of today's session, the Associate Director for Research, Didi Kuo. Thank you so much, Carla, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the first of four webinars we're going to be hosting on HR 1, the For the People Act. Today we're going to be discussing election administration. Tomorrow you can join us again for a discussion on voting rights. Next Monday, a discussion on gerrymandering, and next Tuesday, a discussion on campaign finance. Join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag election reforms, and if you have any questions during today's panel, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box. Today, our panel is um, an amazing group with Wendy Weiser from the Brennan Center, the Vice President for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, Nick Penniman, the founder and CEO of Issue One, Lee Chapman, Senior Director of Voting Rights at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, David Becker, the Executive Director and founder of the Center for Election Innovation and Research, and Charles Stewart III, the Keenan Sahin Distinguished Professor of Political Science at MIT and co-director of the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project with our own Nate Persley. Thank you so much and we'll turn it over to Wendy to begin. Thank you, um, Didi, Carla, to all the folks at Stanford and the Stanford um, uh, MIT Healthy Elections Project for putting together this critically important conversation on timely conversation on HR1. I am going to share my screen. Ready? Um, So I, I'm going to be providing an overview of the election administration reforms of HR1. Um, I believe that HR1 presents a historic opportunity to bring about significant changes to repair and strengthen our democracy, including in the area of election administration. It responds to the twin crises facing our country, the attacks on our democracy, and the urgent demand for racial justice. We just saw in the last election both historic levels of voter mobilization, but also at the same time, unprecedented efforts to thwart the electoral process and disenfranchise voters, primarily in black and brown communities based on falsehoods, lies about voter fraud. These efforts and over 300 lawsuits showed us that our voting system is still rife with barriers, inefficiencies, vulnerabilities to manipulation, barriers that can be exploited to not only to try to disenfranchise voters, but to undermine election administration or sow doubt in our elections. What HR1 does in the election administration space is create a baseline level of voter access that every American can rely on and some federal floor for election administration practices nationwide. And the voter access is especially important given that the courts have, and the federal courts have expressly stepped back from protecting voting rights and thrown the ball to Congress. The election reform provisions in HR1 are built on best practices from the states, reforms that are in place in states across the country, and that for the most part, won bipartisan support in those states. Many of these reforms have long been part of federal bills, and now for the first time, they are the top priority for both houses of Congress. I'll walk through them. The, um, so the first um, and most significant, one of the most significant components of HR1 is a package of upgrades to our voter registration system. Voter registration is a topic that Congress has tackled twice before in the Motor Voter Law of 1993 and the Help America Vote Act of 2002. But despite key improvements, voter registration in much of the country still remains a major source of barriers and problems. 
But over the last 20 years, best practices for voter registration have emerged and have been implemented successfully in states across the country. And here are some of them. And HR1 would extend these nationwide. Um, so the first and critical one that I'll start with is automatic voter registration, which is currently in place in 19 states and DC. This HR1 would require every state to offer automatic voter registration for federal elections so that when an eligible citizen interacts with one of a number of designated government agencies like a DMV or a social service agency, they will automatically be registered to vote or their voter registration information will be automatically updated unless they affirmatively decline participation. The goal of automatic voter registration is to increase registration and turnout, to save money, and to ensure that the voter rolls are more accurate um, and um, secure. And the evidence to date shows that it accomplishes all of these things. It has been tremendously popular. It has grown from the first state to implement automatic voter registration, did so only in 2015. And now we have 19 states in DC have this in place. And I'll just flag some key elements of the automatic voter registration requirements in HR1. It actually expands automatic voter registration beyond just motor vehicle offices where many states have it to a much broader array of government offices, including social service and disability agencies, educational agencies, and several federal agencies. It gives everybody notice and an opportunity to decline registration to opt out before they are added to the voter rolls. While it is generally prospective, it's, it applies to people who are now interacting with government agencies, there is a provision for one time to look back and automatically register people who are currently on government lists once. And it has strong security and privacy protections for voter data and protections against mistakes um, in the registration process. So the other key elements of voter registration reform in HR1 include online voter registration, which is currently in place in 40 states and DC. I'll flag that one thing that HR1 does is expands online voter registration availability beyond voters who have DMV records, which is not the case in many of the states that offer online registration. Same day registration, it requires every state to offer um, the opportunity to register and vote on the same day during both early voting and on election day. This is currently in place in 21 states in DC, also increasingly popular. It would require states to allow future voters who are age 16 and 17 to pre-register to vote so that they can be automatically registered and vote when they turn 18. And it has protections against um, unreliable and inaccurate purges of the voter rolls, which um, I, I'm happy to go into in the Q&A. HR1 also expands voting options available to all Americans. It puts in place all of these best practices um, and I'll walk through them one at a time. It would extend early voting to all 50 states. Currently, 43 states in DC offer it, and it would create a national standard, including a minimum of two weeks, including weekends, 10 hours per day, including early mornings and evenings to accommodate voters of all walks of life. The 2020 election also highlighted the benefits of providing voters with the option of voting by mail. We also saw a hodgepodge of unnecessary barriers to absentee voting in many states. HR1 would expand access to absentee and mail voting nationwide, but it would not go so far as to require states to offer a vote at home system or make mail voting a principal method of voting. And so some of the key provisions in HR1 is it would expand no excuse absentee balloting nationwide. It removes unnecessary barriers to casting mail ballots that we saw in this election like notary and witness requirements. It makes it easier to obtain and cast mail ballots, for example, by requiring states to offer prepaid postage on all absentee voting materials and to offer secure accessible ballot drop boxes um, for 45 days before the election. There are protections for key groups with particular barriers to voting, um, including voters with disabilities, Native American voters, and military and overseas um, voters. 
it reduces barriers to having absentee ballots counted. And this was another big issue that came up in the 2020 election. It requires states to offer voters with notice and an opportunity to cure any defects on absentee ballot supporting materials like a signature match problem. And it requires states to count ballots mailed before but arriving after election day. Critically, to prevent counting delays, it also requires states to begin counting both absentee ballots and early votes at least 14 days before um, election day. HR1 includes a number of provisions to ensure polling place access and to reduce long lines. And I'll highlight um, in that it sets a standard that no individual will be required to wait longer than 30 minutes to cast a ballot. This was a standard that was set by the bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration with that some of my co-panelists um, participated in that was established by President Obama. Um, and it also directs states to equitably allocate voting systems, poll workers, and election resources to ensure a fair and equitable waiting time. We've seen massive disparities in recent years across jurisdictions. Election security is another critical feature of HR1. As we all heard, the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency pronounced the 2020 elections the most secure in US history. While we did prevent the kinds of attack against our election infrastructure that we saw in 2016, our adversaries are getting increasingly sophisticated and aggressive as we just saw by the recent breaches of the US government computer systems at Treasury, Commerce, and the Department of Homeland Security. And there is reason to believe that our election infrastructure remains a key target. So we need to keep ahead of that and put in place additional um, actions to protect it. Here are the key components of HR1 on election security. It would replace all paperless voting machines requiring jurisdictions to use paper ballots that voters can either mark by hand or with a ballot marking device. And this has been um, a change in, in recent years. Most states have already move, uh, made the move to paper, but six states, including Texas and New Jersey, still use paperless systems. That is a security vulnerability. At the same time, it does in provide grants to develop accessible um, paper um, ballot voting for people with disabilities, including verification, casting mechanisms, and best practices for ensuring that they're fully accessible. HR1 has provisions to provide oversight for voting equipment vendors who currently face no regulation, despite the critical role they play in our election system. It would promote robust audits of election results by providing funds for states to adopt what are the gold standard risk limiting audits, which is a new kind of audit that provides a high level of statistical confidence that a hack or a software did not alter the outcome of an election. And it creates standards for other voting technology that is increasingly being used in our election system and does not currently subject to security standards, including electronic poll books. HR1 is not an unfunded mandate to the states. And critically, it specifically includes fundings for the major reforms to election administration, including all of the items I list on this slide, and it permanently authorizes a budget for the federal agency that helps to set standards for um, election um, security and administration. The last thing I will note, um, tomorrow's um, panel is going to focus on voting rights, but um, the key voting rights protections in HR1 are also election administration reforms. I will flag here that HR1 also would restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act, restore voting rights to individuals with past criminal convictions, strengthen protections against voter intimidation and deceptive practices, expand Native American voting rights, and other key voting rights components, all of which are also election administration reforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. All right, Nick, turning it over to you. Uh, great. Hi, all. I, I'm Nick Peniman. I'm the founder and, and uh, CEO of Issue One, which was founded about six years ago. Um, we are a bipartisan political reform organization in Washington, D.C., and we work on a variety of issues, including um, money in politics, congressional reform and functioning, uh, election integrity issues like these. 
um, uh, among others. So uh, we got very involved in this election integrity work um, when we launched a campaign back in 2019 called Don't Mess With Us, which was kind of an anti-foreign interference campaign. We bundled a bunch of different bills together on Capitol Hill that had bipartisan support and proceeded to move forward with those. We got two pretty significant victories late in 2019 on election security measures. And then um, that led us into more election security work in 2020, which kind of culminated in um, two things. Number one, um, the fight to get $400 million into the CARES Act uh, to go out to the states to help them transfer to new voting modalities. And then obviously, as, as many of you might know, we went for more in the HEROES Act, which never got passed. Um, but in addition to that, we launched an ambitious campaign called Count Every Vote, um, where we collected a, a group of 44 prominent Americans um, and compiled them into a thing that we called the National Council on Election Integrity uh, and, and basically pushed back against the notion that the election was full of fraud. Um, we were deeply concerned about what we were hearing out there and we knew there had to be bipartisan pushback. So on our council, we had, um, we had former Trump administration officials like Dan Coats, who was the director of national intelligence. We also had uh, Jim Renacci, who was one of the first house members to endorse Trump for president. Um, 22 of the members were Republican, 22 were Democrats, six were former cabinet secretaries. We had three generals um, and senators. Um, and and it, was, it was this kind of vociferous pushback uh, against, against the notion of fraud or against the kind of integrity of the election. Um, so, and then January 6th happened. And so what, what I'd like to point out kind of big picture as we move forward with this conversation is that, is that January 6th was, was kind of the 9-11 uh, of democracy. And that's no great revelation, but I think that, that as we move forward, we have to think about what happened after 9-11. Because in the wake of any kind of a disastrous event, the stories that we tell coming out of the event are the ones that establish the framework for policies moving forward. And coming out of 9-11, obviously, there's, there were two prominent stories. One was that we had a bunch of holes in our national security infrastructure that needed to be filled. So we created the Department of Homeland Security. We increased our counterterrorism um, intelligence programs and did a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then the other story coming out was that, uh, was that somehow Iraq uh, and Saddam Hussein were a threat to the US and that a logical result of that would be an attack on Iraq. Now that's a you know that's that's a big story, and and that story led to a two trillion dollar twenty year engagement in Iraq. Um, so coming out of this, I think that these stories about the election and the integrity of the election are critical, but also you know the bigger picture is that that January sixth was the culmination of thirty years of neglect of our democracy. Um, not just four years of hyperpartisanship, but 30 years of neglect. And so as a result of that 30 years of neglect, sometimes intentional neglect, sometimes intentional abuse, sometimes unintentional neglect. Um, but as a result of that, we should be having bold, meaningful uh, conversations about how to repair and renew our democracy moving forward. And that's exactly what HR1 does. It, it establishes a powerful framework um, for how to, we should be thinking and talking about democracy repair and renewal moving forward. Um, so we're really happy to be part of this conversation and to be bringing as many bipartisan uh, voices to bear on such a conversation as possible. I just wanna point out um, two other things that, that might, or not, might not come up in the Q&A. Number one, all of us on this call um, should be invested in fighting the big lie. Uh, as we move forward, because uh, the big lie, the big lie that the election somehow was stolen, that the election did not have integrity, that big lie will give birth to many awful things down the road. Uh, local changes, state level changes, elections for um, secretaries of state, uh, uh, you know, the appointments of election administrators. Um, and unless we fight that lie, then all of our jobs to create you know, better voting systems, even with more integrity, are gonna be made much more difficult. So there's that, that kind of big, big goal 
that I think we're, we're all invested in. And then number two, um, you know, we're already seeing some rollbacks occurring at the state level in part based on the big lie, like Texas trying to roll back no excuse absentee, but also we're seeing a bunch of people from the far right who are convinced that the election was stolen. And so they're gonna go try to take over some of the levers of power when it comes to election administration. Uh, you know, I mean, Brad Raffensperger became a, a hero in many Americans' minds for standing up against President Trump and against the attacks on the, the integrity of the Georgia election. Well, as many of you have probably seen, there now are a number of people, QAnon people and others, who are saying that they're gonna run against Raffensperger um, in the future. Uh, and that's occurring all over the place. The, you know, for instance, and many of you will remember the, uh, the board of canvassers in the state of Michigan. I'm, I'm sure plenty of you watched the live stream of the board of canvassers meet in the state of Michigan. That's how wild this all was, right? Um, the, the GOP in, uh, in Michigan has said that they want to remove the one Republican on the board of canvassers who voted to certify the election and put someone in who would be more uh, like-minded with what the GOP is in the state of Michigan right now. So, uh, you know, so we've got a, while we're moving forward with HR1 conversation, fight the big lie, and then, and then play defense as much as possible to make sure that these uh, election administration and secretary of state positions don't get taken over by people who really are more um, authoritarian than small d democratic. And with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll close because I'm sure we're gonna get into more detailed conversation um, uh, after these mini presentations about aspects and the substance of HR1. Thank you so much, Nick. All right, now to Lee Chapman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lee Chapman. I'm the Senior Director of the Voting Rights Program at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Um, we are the nation's oldest and largest civil rights coalition made up of over 220 diverse organizations that are working to build an America as good as its ideals. Um, for far too long, voter suppression has been a shameful reality in our country, undercutting the power and representation of African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, people, people with disabilities, Arab Americans and other communities historically excluded from our political process. The ability to meaningfully participate in our democracy is a racial justice issue. And it's also a civil rights issue. You know, the recent and deadly attack on the US Capitol by far right extremists attempting to overturn the free, fair and secure 2020 presidential election was a catastrophic reminder of the fragility of our democracy. This violent insurrection did not happen in a vacuum. It was paired with numerous hurdles that voters faced during the pandemic plagued 2020 election cycle and exacerbated by the relentless efforts by President Trump to undermine election integrity, impose barriers to the ballot box and discount the votes of communities of color. These experiences reinforced the urgent need to repair our democratic system. Although we had the highest turnout we've ever seen in over a century in the 2020 general election, you know, voters faced a number of hurdles to casting their ballot this year. Voters in states like Georgia and North Carolina stood in hours long lines during early voting. Online voter registration systems crashed in some states such as Florida and Virginia, which created confusion. And a number of states required witness signatures for voters to cast absentee ballots in the middle of a pandemic, forcing voters to make the impossible choice between their health and casting their vote. That so many Americans had to overcome voter purges, polling place changes, voter ID laws, voter intimidation, malfunctioning machines, and hours long wait should shame us as a nation. But what we have seen also reflects a will to move forward with systemic change to ensure that our political system reflects the diverse and multicultural society that we are. Not every flaw in our democracy can be easily fixed, but there are strong and ready solutions to many of the significant voting rights problems and the need for legislative action is urgent. HR1 for the People Act would break down barriers to voting, expand access to the ballot box and ensure the challenges voters face last year won't happen in the next election. Um, just two weeks ago, the leadership conference sent a letter to Congress from 82 organizations, including the Brennan Center, 
um, supporting for the People Act and the transformative vision for American democracy that the legislation represents. Um, I know Wendy highlighted the majority of the elections provisions, but I just wanted to comment on a few of them. Um, in addition to expanding voter registration, early voting, and making it easier to vote by mail, HR1 would importantly restore the right to vote for people with felony convictions. Um, nationally, state laws deny 4.5 million citizens the right to vote because of a criminal conviction, 3.2 million of whom are no longer incarcerated. HR1 adopts a simple and fair rule. If you are out of prison and if you're living in the community, you get to vote in federal elections. We all benefit from the successful reentry of formerly incarcerated citizens in our communities. Restoring their right to vote makes clear that they are entitled to the respect, dignity, and responsibility of full citizenship. HR1 also prohibits deceptive practices and voter intimidation. It would ban the distribution of false information about elections to hinder or discourage voting. And this provision is particularly important in an era in which Facebook, Twitter, and other digital platforms have been readily manipulated to spread misinformation about elections and voting rights to vulnerable communities. The bill would also increase the criminal penalties for intimidating a voter for the purpose of interfering with their right to vote or causing them to vote for or against a candidate. And finally, the legislation commits to restoring the Voting Rights Act of 1965. HR1 contains a commitment to restoring the landmark VRA and updating its preclearance provision, which is crucial to prevent racial discrimination in the voting process. Um, Voting Rights Act restoration is actually being pursued on a separate legislative track and a separate bill that will involve evidentiary hearings, thus enabling Congress to update the preclearance coverage formula and develop a full record on the continuing problem of racial discrimination in voting. Um, in 2006, the VRA was reauthorized on a unanimous vote in the Senate and a near unanimous vote in the House. And we really need that same type of broad bipartisan support for restoring the VRA today. Um, our democracy works best when everyone can fully participate. The voting reforms included in HR1 would revitalize and improve access to the ballot box for all Americans, and the 117th Congress should make passage of HR1 a priority. So thank you, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Lee. Next, we have David Becker. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm David Becker. I am the executive director of the Center for Election Innovation and Research here in Washington, D.C. And we're a nonprofit 501c3 that works with election officials all across the country, all across the political spectrum to bring about elections that are accessible for all and also secure and have maximum integrity. And we were particularly active in this past cycle. Um, we worked very closely with states such as Georgia implementing their new auditable paper ballot system and helping them with their audits, which as you know, were very key in this past cycle. Pennsylvania and Michigan, very similarly. Pennsylvania, many jurisdictions had brand new technology uh, as well, creating paper ballots uh, statewide for the first time. And uh, similarly in Michigan, where we assisted with some audits. And those were very important. I bring all of that up um, to say, as we moved through the election cycle, and we were also active, for instance, um, I'm gonna talk about funding in a second, but funding um, for election administration is absolutely key. We had a problem this year where we did not see adequate funding. Nick raised this point up very well. Uh, Congress did not adequately fund, especially the urgent needs created by the pandemic. And so my organization uh, was able to work through funders to distribute um, tens of millions of dollars of grants to uh, states across the political spectrum around the country to help them educate their voters on changes that had come about as a result of the pandemic specifically. And that led to some uh, very big successes. Um, and this again gets to Nick's point um, about fighting the big lie. It is objectively true in my opinion that um, the, this election was the most secure, scrutinized, and transparent election in American history. It's remarkable we did this in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. Um, we had more people voting than ever before in American history. We had the largest percentage of eligible voters turning out in American history since universal suffrage. Um, and we did this in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, 
We had paper ballots, 95% of people voted on paper ballots that were auditable. Many states did audits of those ballots. We famously know that Georgia counted the presidential race three times in three different ways, including once entirely by hand. So um, this election was a great success. And this brings me to um, HR1 and the environment we're getting into. I usually come into these things as in the role of contrarian. And so I will, I will satisfy everyone and serve that to some degree. I support the vast majority of HR1. I think there are so many good ideas in this bill, but we also have to look at it through the lens of what occurred in 2020 specifically and what the urgent needs are and especially what we might be able to get done in a bipartisan way because I do think there might be some opportunities for bipartisan agreement on things that we can do to strengthen our democracy. So um, first, one of the things we have to recognize is that to some degree federalism not only worked in this last cycle, it actually saved us in many ways. When it comes to the support of the electoral college votes in the states, um, with regard to certain things that states did specifically as they did in Georgia, as they did in Pennsylvania, as they did in Arizona. Federalism had many successes, which doesn't mean it was perfect. There are a lot of things that need to be improved, but I do think we need to look at it through that lens. And also recognize, as I mentioned, uh, the funding issues that came about um, and possibly some other election law changes that we might wanna talk about down the road that aren't criticisms of HR1 at all, but things like minor uh, changes to the Electoral Count Act. Um, with regard to HR1 in particular, um, we have to recognize, and I think everyone got a sense of this from listening to Lee's presentation and Wendy's presentation, HR1 is a sweeping bill. It is massive in scope. If you look at the election administration provisions only, there are literally dozens and dozens of provisions, and they include things, as, as was noted, online voter registration, expanding that out to uh, other agencies, automatic voter registration, doing the same, prohibitions on voter caging, prohibitions on deceptive practices, requiring felon reenfranchisement, paper ballots, um, mandating certain ways of counting provisional ballots. Um, it creates a private right of action under the Help America Vote Act. It prohibits campaign activity, certain campaign activity by chief election officials. It requires independent redistricting commissions for congressional redistricting. So there's a variety of things in there. I haven't even covered half of them yet um, that are in here and it's just a massive sweeping bill. So, um, so uh, and, and uh, Lee also mentioned this, it has findings with regard to the Voting Rights Act. It even has findings in there with regard to DC statehood. So, this is the environment that they want to, that, that, that this bill is being um, promoted. And I think one of the problems with the bill this sweeping, even though there's so much good in it, is that there's so many things in here that there's easy to find something that some legislators are going to have difficulty with. And we're not just talking about Republican legislators. We're also talking in many cases, Democratic legislators who are gonna hear from their election officials, often also Democrats, about how difficult some of these things will be to implement. And we'll have to really consider that. I mean, this doesn't mean they're bad ideas or they shouldn't be standalone bills or they shouldn't have longer scope. And I just wanna stress that again, because I support so many of the things in here. But a great example is, for instance, online voter registration. Online voter registration is something that I think all of us agree is a wonderful reform. I have personally advocated for it in many, many states, um, but different states do it in different ways. And although the vast majority of states, over 40, have online voter registration in some form under HR1, there would be some somewhat difficult to implement changes needed. And this would be important. I think we really need to listen to our election officials on this to understand where the implementation challenges might be so that we don't create new problems and we address the challenges that we now find ourselves in in 2020 after this past election cycle. Um, I'd also, I also did allude to this. Um, there's, there's just no way around this. There's gonna be significant political resistance. And I'll tell you my personal opinion is I don't think there are 50 Democratic votes for this in the Senate. Others might disagree. Um, I think there are going to be um, a lot of challenges in getting this passed through the Senate. And I think a bill this sweeping also could have a negative effect on bringing about the kinds of changes that we really need, which might be more targeted and modest in some cases because we had um, so many successes in this past election cycle. Um, I think things that really need to be addressed where we do need to see a federal floor established. In other words, all states doing the same thing um, 
are areas like mail voting, allowing everyone to receive a mail ballot without an excuse, but also offering some ways for Republicans to get behind some of these changes. So for instance, perhaps standardizing when those ballots have to be returned, perhaps reducing the gray area during which time uh, ballots may be received late with a postmark, um, perhaps standardizing some form of identity validation for those ballots so that we have something that both sides can get behind while still maximizing access for, um, for voters. I think another big provision, and it's in HR1 largely, and I think that this is a really good idea, is we need to get those last 5% of American voters voting on paper ballots that can be audited and then mandating some kind of audit. I don't know whether it needs to be um, the, the, uh, a risk limiting audit per se, but some kind of audit that gives us some statistical certainty that, um, that the technology worked as it in, was intended and that results were accurate. And then lastly, this is something I think, um, I think HR1 actually doesn't go far enough, which is not to say that it, there couldn't be additional bills to do this, and that's funding. And I keep hammering this. I'm um, talking to election officials across the country, again, both sides of the aisle. One of the biggest issues is they don't have adequate funds and resources to administer elections as effectively as possible. And when they run into problems like the pandemic, that's, that, that problem is made much, much worse. Um, we have seen in several bills, Help America Vote Act, the CARES Act, kind of episodic funding that comes out in a chunk and is never repeated again. And that's nice. It's always good to get that funding for election officials, but what they need is regular repeated funding on an annual basis. And I'd love to see some kind of legislation, whether it's ultimately included in HR1 or as part of a separate bill, um, that provides much more regular funding over a long period of time that gets to the states and to the local election officials to allow them to save up for new technology when it's coming, to fund purchases that are needed as an emergency, um, to also, where necessary, hire staff that is highly trained, particularly on things like um, cybersecurity and IT. So I think those are things that I'd, I'd like to see a little more in some of these things. As I said, I, I do want to stress, I am not opposed to the vast majority of things in HR1. I think the, 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 folk, the, the challenge we have is getting a bill this sweeping across and whether we might wanna take this opportunity to do something that's a little more targeted and focused. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, David. All right, finally, we'll be turning it to Charles Stewart the third. Thanks so much and thanks everyone for um, organizing the session today at the um, at the risk of sounding um, like a broken record with David, um, some of my comments are very similar to, um, to David's um, in a couple of ways. One, in saying that this um, HR1 is a bill about which I, I agree with um, much, indeed most of it, um, both, um, um, well, in part because of my own values about election, the importance of of protecting it, but also because many of the features in the bill really are best practices that have been tried and true um, throughout the country. Um, as Wendy mentioned in her description of the bill, that many of the reforms, especially the big ones like um, election uh, same day registration and um, online voter registration, etc. These are things that are done nationwide done by most states or close to most states. Um, and so, you know, these are best practices that if we wanted to ensure kind of well-run elections around America, we would want to encourage many, if not all these practices um, that are in the election administration portion of HR1 to be universal throughout the country. That having been said, um, this is an enormous bill. Um, um, and again, I mean, these are some of the same things that David um, said, but I, by my counting, there are 19 discrete subjects in the election administration portion of the bill. I won't go through all of them. Um, Wendy mentioned most, but not all. Um, David mentioned many more, but not all. Um, and, um, and I mentioned that only to note that in the history of Congress that dealing with election administration issues, um, certainly over the last three decades, 
Um, the bills that Congress has eventually gotten out have been basically single issue bills. The NVRA, um, um, the two UACAVA um, acts, UACAVA Act and the MOVE Act. Um, HAVA we can think about as being slightly larger than one issue, but it was still a small number of issues really of um, provisional ballots, um, voter registration, um, um, education of poll workers, and, um, and voting machines. Um, pretty limited with a big chunk of money. And so we're talking here about 19 major subject areas, um, an order of magnitude more complexity than anything er that Congress has ever um, put together before. And because of that, I do worry about a single bill collapsing on its own weight, um, particularly since, um, again, getting back to a, 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 um, um, a theme that David introduced, because of federalism, states have been able to adapt the, the, many of these um, procedures to state and local practices and structure of state and local government. Um, whereas in this case, there would be a unified way of doing many things, such as um, early voting and mail balloting, et cetera. There's something to be argued for uniformity within states for sure. One needs to, I think, think carefully about um, the um, degree to which we want to push on uniformity within states. And so Congress is going to be faced with either fine tuning HR1 um, to um, accommodate these state differences or is going to find many parts of the bill, I think, just go down because of an inability to get states on board, including many Democratic states that are going to have problems with the details of some of this legislation. And so, so that's one thing, um, as, as laudable as it is to comprehensively look at an election administration in the United States, I worry that the whole thing might come down on its weight. Having said that, um, I do want to point out, actually point out something. Um, um, well, actually say one more thing and then point out something else. As David says, um, many of these provisions will face Republican um, opposition and that's gonna be another thing that um, um, needs to be considered as the whole package gets pushed through. All this said, I will note that there is one set of items that I think actually could get broad bipartisan support um, both David um, and Wendy mentioned them, which has to do with election security. And there are, there are items in there related to bringing um, e-poll books into the regime of um, election systems, systematizing attention to cybersecurity and elections, supporting election technology research, um, incenting states to adopt um, risk-limiting audits. These, in fact, are a lot of reforms that Nate um, personally and I um, worked on for a National Academy of Sciences report on the future of elections. Um, and so there are some things in here, actually, I think will get um, broad bipartisan support. Um, there are other things that will be more contentious, either because of partisanship or because they're just so complicated um, and may go down under their own weight. The final thing I'll say is that I think we also, this is an opportunity, while we don't want to be always just fighting the last, the last war, so to speak, um, there are some things about this last election that I think could, um, having now argued that the HR1 may be too capacious, there are some things that actually could be added to a bill like this to really focus on um, what we've learned from this election in terms of election administration. Um, one is that um, I think we learned that emergency planning needs to go up a level. Now, there are provisions in HR 1 that require states to adopt emergency plans and report back, um, to report back to Congress. But I also think, in my reading, um, and there was a lot to read in the bill, but, but I think there's also a national kind of disaster category for election disasters that needs to be thought about. Um, for dealing with natural disasters, pandemics, and those sorts of things to give some authority for the, for the federal government to take some responsibility for making sure that states can adapt fiscally when they're faced with pandemics or hurricanes. Um, it's been mentioned already that there are problems with 
funding of elections. Um, while I'm delighted that private philanthropy came through to save this election, in the end, private philanthropy will have given more money to save in this election than the federal government did. We can't count on um, bake sales for democracy in the future. So to create an understood national structure for dealing with emergencies when there are systemic existential threats to our elections um, is an important thing that um, I, I hope people can give some, give some thought about. And then finally, there were, at, at a smaller level, there were important adaptations this time that I, I think that we need to figure out how to institutionalize. And it would be good to do it in a vehicle like HR1, either what it is or what it might become. For instance, developing nationwide ways of um, recruiting poll workers, communicating to voters about changes at the last minute, using social media. Um, and getting expertise parachuted into jurisdictions that need it to manage change. These were important innovations in this election that we don't want to lose and we want to institutionalize. And so this is also an opportunity to think about those things, which are relatively new, and to incorporate them in, into any sort of um, reform that HR1 becomes. So at that point, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. This is an enormous opportunity um, for the future of elections and administration. I look forward to the discussion. Well, I think it's uh, now my turn to jump in. We have a lot of uh, questions in the in the Q&A, and so um, uh, Dee Dee will, will voice some of those. Um, but but uh, since Lee Chapman has to run, I, I want to at least give her an opportunity to voice what, what you think um, are the most important election administration provisions here. I mean, if, if if there is going to be editing of HR 1, um, what parts do you think are the most critical that they stay in? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, in my former position, I used to work for the Pennsylvania Secretary of State during the 2016 election. So um, yes, we need more options for voters to cast their ballot. And that's one thing that's so important about HR 1 is that you know there's a mandatory two weeks of early voting, there's expanded um, online voter registration, there's same day registration, and there's automatic voter registration, which if enacted would actually add 50 million more voters to the rolls. And that's a Brennan Center statistic um, that we often use. So I think that this pandemic really shows that voters need and they want more options and that these options should definitely stay. Um, I would also say that one thing that HR1 does um, that a lot of people probably don't know about is it was updated to include some of the um, election administration provisions that voters really use during this pandemic, like absentee ballot drop boxes, which really was essential to make sure that voters were able to cast their ballot and, and vote safely and, and expanding curbside voting. That's something that's also very important and critical. Um, one thing that wasn't touched on um, as much today was the prohibition on voter purges. Um, and you know, that's something that we have seen um, in states like Georgia and of course, voters of color are usually the ones that are most targeted and kicked off the rolls. So we've seen efforts already in state legislatures. I believe Mississippi already um, recently introduced a bill um, that would institute a new purge process. So, you know, we believe that voting should not be a use it or lose it right. So that's another critical provision that would, you know, really reverse um, the Houston versus APRI Supreme Court decision from a few years back. Um, I want to ask, I'm going to ask Wendy and Nick to weigh in on the politics of this and the compromises that might be on the table. But Lee, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that, which is like, is this um, dead on arrival because it's going to be seen as um, um, to th that the Republicans in particular are going to object too much to it? Um, um, do you think that there's a compromise that's available? And then if, if you want to deflect that to, to, to our other panelists, that's fine. But I want to give you an opportunity to, to answer that too. No, you know, HR1 is a transformative bill. And I think that, um, you know, there were so many issues that came to light during the last election in the 2020 election cycle, and it would fix so many problems. It would fix problems for all Americans, right? Republicans and Democrats. And everyone should really get behind this legislation. And that's something that the leadership conference in our coalition will be doing is to really push um, both Democrats and Republicans to support this legislation. And, you know, we're going to, going to be using all of our 220 member organizations to do that. So, 
I don't believe it's dead on arrival. Yes, it's going to require some work um, by all of us um, and also by some unlikely allies too to get behind this legislation, but um, no, we're gonna just continue to push forward. Wendy, do you want to weigh in a little bit on the, on, I mean, it, there, there's a political, realpolitik side to this question, but it's also about uh, stra legislative strategy and how we should think about this. I think Lee is right, which is that this is, and, and, and this echoes Charles's point, which is this is a different kind of bill, right? Um, it is an attempt to, to really transform American democracy. Uh, and so it is not in the, in the vein of, you know, motor voter or hover, or pick, your, pick your analogy. Um, uh, so how should we think about the um, work going narrow versus going broad here uh, and, and what that would mean in the current political climate? So, yes, I, I think that um, that is the key difference here, that this is not a narrow bill. And I think that uh, that is more of a strength than as a weakness in the legislation, because we've been in the midst of more than a decades long erosion of some of our key democratic um, systems, not just you know, vote suppression, extreme gerrymandering, um, a concentration of um, power to a small group of mega donors over the campaign finance system. People feel more and more disempowered in the critical democratic systems and functions. And I think tinkering around the edges having small fixes to small problems isn't going to start to solve the problem. And I think the politics of that is reflected and, and how popular that is in the fact that both houses of Congress, as soon as the Democrats took, took control, put it as number one, as their first bill. I think at least the le Democratic leadership believes, as I do, that there is actual significant power in putting forward a transformative vision for, hey, we can fix these big problems of our democracy and get back on track. And just as for the bipartisanship, I'll just flag, virtually everything in HR1 has been passed with extreme bipartisan support in some state somewhere or some jurisdiction somewhere. And the politics and the partisan alignment around these issues keeps shifting. The Voting Rights Act was passed unanimously in the Senate and with overwhelming bipartisan majorities back in 2006. And then the um, after the Shelby County decision, couldn't even get one, um, one Republican co-sponsor for the um, Voting Rights Advancement Act um, in the House, for example. So the, it's a moving target. Um, Act 75 in Pennsylvania, which expanded access to absentee voting, created no excuse absentee balloting, um, passed with significant bipartisan support um, back in 2019. Now it's under attack in Pennsylvania after the politicization of mail voting in this last election cycle. So looking at you know, where Republic, you know, particular Republicans are in a given moment, especially at a time when we are seeing a concerted attack on our democratic institutions is I don't think the right way to look at it. And so, um, and just the other, there are many ways um, for passing this bill that do not require bipartisan support. I do think that bipartisan support may be forthcoming. I mean, we're the, let, let's see how it goes, but these are very popular reforms. Right, Nick, do you want to weigh in on this question? Then I'll, I'll turn it over to Didi to, to uh, get some questions. We've got lots in the Q&A. Sure. I mean, um, so my organization did more than 200 Hill meetings in 2019, less so last, last year because of COVID. But um, uh, two thirds of those meetings in 2019 were with Republican offices. Here's the problem. Um, the number of, uh, and Wendy knows this, and so does Lee, I'm sure, and others, Dave, you know, David, who get up to the Hill often, the, the knowledge of members of Congress and their staff about these issues in general is extremely limited. Um, and that's on the Democratic side of the aisle and on the, certainly on the Republican side of the aisle. Um, there are misperceptions around democracy reforms. There are misperceptions about what's going on or not going on. So, um, part of what we're facing here is just a huge knowledge gap, a knowledge and understanding gap on the Hill. And there's no doubt that that's cutting against us harder on the Republican side of the aisle than on the Democratic side of the aisle. Um, I, you know, I currently can't name a single Republican senator or House member who would vote for this bill in its entirety. 
Um, that's just where the bill is at this point. That's just a, a simple fact. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be having the bold and ambitious conversation that this bill creates. Because again, you know, in the wake of, you know, in the wake of a, of a huge disaster like January 6th was, if we were to only be having kind of siloed conversations, micro conversations around policy, I think we'd be missing the moment. Um, it might come down to eventually having to move various pieces of legislation in different ways to solve for different things. But let's have the big conversation right now and let's all do what we can to be bringing as many Republican and Democratic voices to bear on those conversations as possible. Uh, Dee Dee, why don't I turn it to you uh, to bring in some questions from the Q&A and I also, if, if other panelists want to uh, weigh in on this, please just uh, uh, text me in the chat and uh, I'll, I'll call on you. Dee Dee, let me turn it to you. Okay, excellent. Just a quick note to our attendees. If you could, instead of raising your hands or shooting a message to the panelists, use the Q&A if you have any questions. So the first question is to Wendy and Lee and continues this, I guess we'll start with Lee since you have to go in four minutes, continues this question of the challenges to HR1. What do you think will be the legal challenges to HR1? In particular, what provisions of it might not withstand Supreme Court scrutiny and how would those legal uh, battles begin? Lee. I'll kick that over to Wendy. I know Wendy has researched yeah. that more than I. So um, thank you. Um, so HR1, the provisions of HR1 are almost all authorized by the elections clause in the US Constitution, which says that, well, states ordinarily prescribe the times, places, and manners of holding elections, Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. Um, so that is, and the Supreme Court has interpreted that as broadly as possible, giving Congress a mandate to write a whole code of elections for federal elections. It applies only to federal elections if it so chooses. Um, that has reaffirmed this as recently um, as um, just the, the last um, partisan gerrymandering case and even in some of the um, motion orders that it has issued during this pandemic. So this is the argument that this is somehow a congressional overreach and taking powers that are reserved to the states is just expressly not true under the Constitution and under repeated Supreme Court jurisprudence. There is another provision of the Constitution that does authorize some of the other provisions and some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about more tomorrow on the voting right side, which are the 14th and 15th amendments, which also give Congress powers in both the state and federal elections to deter and remedy discrimination in voting. And so so those are, um, I, you know, the arguments that there's some legal challenges that are um, threatening um, HR1 are just um, baseless in my view. All right, if no other panelists wanna weigh in, then um, we will try to ask one more question. There are so many Republican efforts underway at the state level to try to restrict voting, as you noted. How would the bill preempt some of those challenges or override some of those challenges if those were passed by state legislatures? Yeah, it's a really good point. You know, right now um, we have over 10,000 election jurisdictions in our country. So elections are run very differently depending on what state you live in or what locality that you live in. Um, so HR1 would provide more national standards for, for voting and for elections, which is something that we've needed. You know, there's no reason why voters in California um, vote differently than voters in Louisiana and Alabama. You know, we need to have uniform standards. So that's what HR1 would do, um, at least in the context of federal elections. Um, so that's that's basically what um, the provisions um, would, would allow for. Excellent, thanks. Did any other panelists want to jump in on the relationship of sort of these fe new federal laws potentially and Republican laws that are coming? To uh, Dee, Dee I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. I largely agree with everything that was just said. I will just point out, as they, as both Lee and Wendy have pointed out, this is only for federal elections. That's only that's the only place Congress has the authority to legislate. Uh, there have been circumstances in the in the past, and they are rare, where uh, states have created dual parallel systems: one for state elections, which would elect things like members of the state legislature, and one for federal elections for members of Congress and other federal officials. And I do worry that given the nature of this bill and how sweeping it is that this might incentivize uh, 
uh, this kind of very bad idea of creating parallel systems, which further hampers possible implementation of this. And even if the election officials, whether they're Republican or Democrat, might really encourage a single system that complies with the federal provisions, we are now seeing, given what we're seeing in the state legislatures, the state legislatures might balk at that. And um, this is why I think it's so important not to miss this opportunity that maybe a more targeted bill might achieve what we need because there clearly is a need. I think one thing we'd all agree on, there is a need for a common floor for federal elections across the United States. I think there might be tweaks around where that floor falls, but we desperately need that and we need that soon. We need it during a probably a very brief window before the 2022 election cycle really kicks into gear and those political, political dynamics are set. Can I ask you and Charles on this question of what might be most controversial from the standpoint of the election administrators? Um, I mean, leave aside the partisan stuff, which is what we all tend to focus on. You mentioned on, um, uh, online voter registration, David, is what you thought might be the most maybe yeah, I just use that for example. I do not think that's the most controversial by any means. I, no, think no, I mean, I, I, look, obviously, the campaign finance provisions and all that, but I mean, just in the election ministry, just to give the, the viewers a little bit of a sense of what kinds of federal mandates do trigger um, anxiety among the election officials and those that don't. Obviously, everybody wants funding, right? I, that is to say, the, the, the election officials do. Which of these provisions are the ones where they're going to sort of hold their heads in their hands and be like, eh? I'll answer very briefly. I think automatic voter registration, same day registration, both things I've heard from election officials and legislators in the states that they're uh, they're concerned about. And one area that doesn't at all, echoing what Charles said, the paper ballots, the audits generally do not. That is a, an area for, for bipartisan consensus. Can, can, can I give, it, give an example about something, something I'm thinking about? Um, when I say, I, I just wonder how deeply in the weeds Congress is gonna be willing to get into it. Um, reading through the provision um, requiring um, what the 15 days of early voting, 10 hours a day, you must do you, and, and it must either be before nine or after five. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm in I'm in a um, I'm in a state that has 351 towns. Counties do not run elections. Okay, so is Florida, Massachusetts, that has 20 voters, going to be required to run? you know, basically the same um, early voting um, program that Orange County, Florida is gonna be required um, to run. Um, um, and in fact, most election jurisdictions in America are towns, not counties. Now, that can be easily dealt with and the states that have early voting deal with that over all the time. Texas, which probably has the most extensive program of early voting, has the smallest county in America. So there are ways of dealing with this right, at the state level. But I can easily imagine, you know, the election officials in Massachusetts leaning on the Democratic delegation in Massachusetts to oppose parts of H.R. 1 because what it's going to do to, you know, Cuddy Hunk and Florida and those little jurisdictions. Um, and so, and, and, and the bill is full of things like that. They're just going to kind of raise the, the, um, raise the blood pressure of, of local election officials, all of whom have close ties to elected officials and um, can, can throw a spanner in the works. If, if I could just respond to that, um, the bill also has a host of exceptions and workarounds and provisions precisely to address those situations where the uniform rule might have to be adjusted. And I think that is something that has been developed over years working with election officials. And as it moves towards passage, there will be further opportunities to refine those and ensure that there aren't any fact patterns that aren't taken into account. Um, and to David's statement that election officials are, are worried about the registration requirements, these requirements are in place in states across the country already. They, election officials support them as reforms. The question is, will the details of how the legislation is enacted be consistent with the systems that they have and that they want to put in place? Yeah. Automatic voter registration, there's 
a grandfather provision that ensures that existing automatic voter registration systems will um, be um, will meet the criteria. But again, these are all solvable problems. The big picture is this is the vision for what automatic voter registration and voter registration should look like in America today. These are the best practices that not only states are moving towards, but that every American should be able to rely on. We, we know how to do it. We have the resources available to do it. And this should, you know, tweaking the details of the mandate should be something that election officials can and should partner with. There is bipartisan support for these actual reforms in the states. And, 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 yeah, Nick, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, and therein lies the political challenge, one of the political challenges, right? Um, if normally when members are, you know, when you do a member meeting and the Congressman or the Senator has something in his or her head, you, you will not believe how quickly they can just try to move on. Oh, I heard that's not a good thing, next, right? Um, so this is, this is the knowledge gap that we're gonna be dealing with um, on the Hill. And if they, if they have heard from some local election administration officials that there are aspects of this bill that are difficult, then that's the kind of you know, thing that's gonna be echoing around in their head. Um, so if, you know, if that's not the case, then it, you gotta get on them early and now to convince them that that's not. But that's the thing, you know, normally when these, when the, when these members are thinking about leaning into legislation, if they're hearing positive stuff from their constituents, the constituents that are gonna be affected back home, like, yeah, we want this, bring on this regulation or bring on this funding, then it makes it a lot easier for the congressman. But if they're actually hearing from the constituents that are gonna be affected, like the administration, election administration officials, Ugh, this is gonna be tough, then that just makes it so much harder for them to, to activate as champions. So we've got eight minutes and 47 questions, Dee Dee. Uh, uh, do you want to, 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 if you can group them thematically, uh, is, is there something that would be, that we could, uh, you know. Sure. There, there's the some, greatest answer for the greatest number, I guess. Yeah. Right. There's a category of questions around the pre-clearance requirement of the, of the VRA, Section 5 of the VRA, and I'm how that say, would work. People should should wait till tomorrow on that. Okay. That, that Stay tuned. You know, tomorrow we're going to talk more about the voting rights provisions. Yeah. Okay. And then a second set of sort of clarifying questions about how exactly the opt-out and exceptions work within the bill. So it, it does, our understanding is that it creates a federal floor, but how do states, how will they be able to carve out specific um, opt-outs for different circumstances from state to state? Um, there isn't a blanket one. In particular provisions, um, uh, like I, I mentioned, um, you know, the automatic voter registration provision acknowledges that there are some states that already have systems and it has a provision to um, adapt to those existing systems. Other federal legislation that is passed in the voting area has frequently done this kind of thing. Like when um, the motor voter law actually exempts states that had same day registration or election day registration at the time it was passed. So there are particular provisions that are tied to particular mandates, um, not a general opt out. I think the goal here is to actually have a federal floor of you know, best practice voting rules across the country and only to have those tweaks that are necessary for um, the exceptional circumstances. And, and this is, again, one of those details, I, you know, a lot of details. There's a number of places in HR1, then you get to the end of the section or the part or whatever, and there's a statement which says, nothing in this section will bar a state from being less restrictive, for instance. Um, and so that's throughout the bill. Now, as was suggested, well, who determines what's less restrictive? And so on the one hand, with it not being stated in the bill, it looks like um, Mark Elias and others are gonna be really, really busy in um, litigating this, thing number one, or thing number two, the temptation may be to turn the EAC into a regulatory body that can make these judgments and that's gonna be tricky too. So again, I'm not suggesting there's no way out of this, but I think that this mechanism for adjudicating what is not you know, less restrictive or and gets one out of some of these requirements is gonna be, I think, really, really an important detail. I think it will be the courts actually that are gonna do, I see David nodding, so you can amplify that if you want. 
Yeah, I, I just want to point out that we just went through an election cycle where perceived differences in the states and how they uh, administered elections were leveraged by people who were inherently anti-democratic, who could not process the idea that their candidate had lost. And these were mostly lies. I mean, the idea that Georgia and Ohio have vastly different election systems is just false. I mean, they both allow no excuse absentee voting. They both allow extensive in-person early voting and they both allow election day voting. They both manage their voter list very similarly. Um, the big, biggest difference in those two states was one state went for Trump, one went, went for Biden and the state that went for, by Trump went for Trump by a larger margin than the state that went for Biden went by. That's really the only difference. And we have to think about that when we're thinking about legislation. I think floors with exceptions where you can fall to the floor, some states fall below and some states go above, creates that dynamic that can be leveraged further. I think trying to figure out what a real floor is, and Wendy, you're quite right. I, I, by the way, I agree with everything almost everyone has said on this. I, I mean that sincerely. But um, you know, the, the exceptions for the NVRA have caused problems in the past, and there are states that have same-day registration, even better same-day registration than some of the states that were exempted from the NVRA now that are not exempted from the NVRA. HAVA's statewide voter registration database provisions do not, do, do not, are not enforced and, and applied the same way in every state, and that creates problems. I think we should be thinking about these things as established. What is the real realistic floor we could achieve, both politically and administratively, and try to achieve that? And then, by the way, don't stop. We should keep trying to build and build that floor higher and higher and higher over time. But that's just kind of the practical way I go about it, especially seeing how the differences of the states were leveraged by anti democratic forces and disinformation this past cycle. Okay, so the final set of questions um, has to do with election administration. We know that globally, best practices for election integrity calls for professional, independent management bodies, uh, whereas in the United States, we have devolved power to the states and also partisan election administration officials. So how, why is it that, um, or does the bill try to establish some kind of nonpartisan administration of elections and power the EAC, et cetera? What do you see as the future in that for elections in that regard? We can start with you, Wendy or David. Okay, well, the bill does not tackle that issue very much. There is a provision that um, prohibits election officials from, um, uh, from in having a conflict of interest serving as the um, head of a re-election campaign of um, some election they are managing other than their own, um, but it does not tackle the um, partisan election administration issue in America. And I think that, you know, there's going to be, a, there are a lot of challenges that election officials face and that are now increasing in light of all of the attacks on elections this year. The, you know, election officials faced death threats for doing their jobs. They did not, were not given nearly the resources they needed. They needed to go to seek charitable contributions because the government wasn't financing the basic operation that they were doing. Um, they are under now increasing and relentless partisan pressure to do things that are wholly inconsistent with their mandate and with their job. This is going to be a much more serious problem than it was when HR1 was first pulled together. And I don't think um, we, no, HR1 uh, is filled with best practices that we know work and that are already working in many states. This is something that we need to grapple with now and urgently um, over the next year. We, we have elections coming up with these new pressures, but I don't know that um, there is a set of best practices and a consensus that has coalesced yet. I'll be the contrarian again for a moment. It's not really a contrarian because I think one of the things, I think this is one of the reasons a floor is so important. A floor that can be legally enforced, that's actually enforceable and practical is so important. And again, we all agree that that floor should be there, I think. Um, but I'll also say, I'm actually, I, I actually think this nonpartisan election administration is somewhat of a red herring. I think that um, I've known very, very good election officials who are partisan and bad election officials who are nonpartisan. And if you ask Jocelyn Benson, a Democrat in Michigan, and Brad Raffensberger, a Republican in Georgia, and the supposedly nonpartisan Wisconsin Election Commission, I don't think they would say that the labels that any one of them had um, inoculated them against uh, criticism or some of the craziness that, it, that, that came about. And I'll actually even say, I think, it, you know, I think it's incredibly valuable 
that Brad Raffensperger as a Republican stood up for the election of a Democrat because that's what actually happened in his state. I think it's incredibly valuable that the North Carolina State Board of Elections, which uh, is led by a Democrat currently, stood up for the election of Donald Trump, a Republican in that state. I think those kinds of things are very, very valuable and that's where most people lie. I actually, I'll give, I'll give a lot of credit to HR1. I thought the pro provision on campaign activity, I don't know if it should be in a federal bill, but I thought it was very well thought out. I personally, I think there, there's limited things that should be regulated. And, and, and I thought that that really focused on the very limited things that should be regulated um, in terms of campaign activity. Well, we want to make sure we stay on time for all of these uh, sem seminars since we're doing four of them. And so I want to thank the, the four to 500 people who joined us, uh, and we will try to uh, find other ways to answer your questions. Um, tomorrow, please join back in when we'll be talking about the voting rights provisions. Um, you know, this is a very big bill, but we're going to try to take uh, the, the sort of four largest categories of issues and deal with them today, tomorrow, uh, next Monday, and next Tuesday. So tomorrow's voting rights. Uh, next Monday, we'll talk about the gerrymandering redistricting provisions. And then next Tuesday, we'll talk about campaign finance. Thank you all. Uh, thank you especially to the organizers of, of this event at CDDRL, at PAX, uh, and at Stanford generally. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Everyone.